Hey, uh, my name is Reggae Jean Page, and this is Burning Questions with Variety. Because this is called Burning Questions, I do mm. have to start with the burn for you speech on Simon and Daphne's mm. wedding night. It lit the internet aflame. You said there were no more puns. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, there's one more pun. So is this what I'm bracing myself for? Are we yes. getting more puns through the burning question? Oh. Just the one? When you first read the script, did you know that that scene was going to be such a big deal to people? No, no, I don't think so. We knew it was a big moment in the character's life, in kind of the life of this relationship, and it was a very kind of big, pivotal turning point. I don't know, maybe we should have known, because it was definitely a center for Phoebe and I. Like, it was just kind of like, okay, this is a big kind of twist on exactly where we are and what the series means after this point. But I think it's, it's a big moment for us, and I'm glad that that translated to everyone else. Look at you, you're downright flush. Yes, that is what happens. When one is angry. When one burns for someone who does not feel the same. Other than your own, what's your favorite romantic line in a TV show or movie? Oh, gosh. I always remember uh, the Love Actually cards, just because that's etched into everyone's memory and it's been pastiched so many times that you kind of can't get rid of it, if you wanted to. <laughs> Rank your top five sexiest Shondaland shows. You're asking me to pick my children. It's like, which is your favorite child? Rank them from five to one. I think they're all very, very sexy in their own entirely separate ways. I'm gonna back my own show. I'm gonna put Bridges on the top in terms of the sexiest ranks. I think it'd be slightly facetious not to. I think Scandal absolutely got out there. I think things happened in the Oval Office <laughs> in Scandal <laughs> that none of us expected to see. Grey's had some very hard moments. Grace has had some very hard moments. You know what, Station 19 has been doing some burning for each other. So I think, I think we're gonna bring the new kid in at number four, and then in slightly more twisted ways, Murder's had its moments. It's not usually quite as straightforward in Murder, but it's there. <laughs> Why will Simon not be part of season two? It was kind of always the plan. It's in the books, you kind of have one sibling per, and Simon was this kind of bomb of a, a one season antagonist to be reformed and to find his true self through Daphne. I think one of the bravest things about the romance genre is allowing people a happy ending. People were very scared of Shondaland for this reason. So like, they like to kill our favorite characters and like mess things up and bring the drama. And the one thing that I saw that fans were quite concerned about with that is that the point of when you pick these books up is you're almost guaranteed, it's a little promise, that things will be okay. Like, we're gonna take you through this and then we're gonna tie it up so you can go home and have your, have your happily ever after. And that's kind of how we framed and tied it. When did you realize Simon could be a special character? Oh, you realize Simon could be special from the moment you pick him up. The moment you pick him up on the script, he's special. The opportunities that we opened up with Simon, these were kind of the center of Shonda and I's conversations at the beginning, in terms of you don't get to see female-centric television this often, in terms of where the lens is looking at this from. You don't get to see the angle that we took on Simon's masculinity, because he's he's of an archetype that we do know. He is, you know, Darcy, Heathcliff, um, all your Clint Eastwood types. He's tall, dark, brooding, and thoroughly broken, and thoroughly toxic. And in terms of making him a romantic hero, we really wanted to talk about how you earn the second half of that, how you earn hero in Romantic Hero. What's attractive for me about Simon is where he gets to despite those difficult toxic edges and how he reforms that, how he gets to all of the intelligent, generous, inventive, and soft parts underneath, how he comes to reconcile himself with his own wounds, how he comes to understand himself better, how he comes to be able to communicate better with Daphne. That's what's attractive about this dude. And so hopefully if we've put that into the canon, that's what I want to tie up with a bow. That every time you're thinking about what does a romantic hero look like, we've contributed a step in the direction that's closer to what a 21st century romantic hero should look like, even if we're in the 19th. You did win the NAACP Image Award for this role. To represent us in the fullness of our humanity, of our beauty, of our joy, of our glamour, of our splendour, of our royalty, of our romance, of our love. It is the highest honour to represent that and to represent the people I do represent. And I will do my absolute best to be worthy of that. What have you made of the Black community's reaction to Bridgerton and to your role in it? It's been very touching. It was another really important thing in terms of why I wanted to tell the story in the first place. 
Because if we're talking about tokenization, the inverse of that is exclusion. And what you don't see is glamorous, ambitious black love on screen. You don't see black folks with status, with glamour, with jewels, with nothing to worry about other than dealing with our own souls. You know, usually it's someone else metting out the pain on ourselves. And it's like, you know what? We got complex internal life too. And I think, so if nothing else, just in imagery, I think that's been very powerful for people. And I hope that whatever people carry forward from that, whatever work comes out of that in other places, that it's been nourished by just simply seeing what's possible. And you've also talked a lot about how you've read scripts throughout your career where as a black man, your experience is tokenized and fetishized, but not in Shondaland. So what is it about what they do that is different? I think there's a desire to contribute at Shondaland. It's an analogy that Shonda and I have shared, which we didn't know that we've both been using for years. It's about getting your vitamins in the story. Like, yes, you will have shocks and twists and turns, but you will never ever forget the humanity at the center of it. And you will never ever forget that you are serving an audience with it. It's not self-indulgent. It's always incredibly aware of who's watching and what it is we want to give for them to receive. Then you will reflect that on screen because you're like, you know what we haven't received? A non-tokenized role. Because as far as you're concerned, your audience aren't tokens because you're considering everyone. And so I think it will continue to improve in that way. Because I think you always, also always have to acknowledge that you're not there yet. The best and worst thing about progress is that it raises the bar and you have to then get better again and get better again and listen to what other people do with the work that you've done and improve on that. It obviously hasn't been an overnight rise to like everybody knowing who you are, but in some instances it kind of has, but we've also been in the house. So how have you kind of reconciled all of those things at the same time? It means I can reconcile all of those things over a cup of tea, which is great. It's just, it's been a lot cozier is what it's been. It, it's lovely to be able to, in kind of the internet age, be connected to everyone as they are receiving the thing you put out, but also to do it from the comfort of my couch. Um, which is nice because then it's, it's exactly that. It's that warm, cozy hug. It's not kind of glitz and events and photography and carpets and all of the kind of extraneous stuff. It's literally just the connection of the work and the audience and what people receive and what their sentiment is and what their excitement is. But you don't, it doesn't have to be dressed in everything else. It's a lot more intimate this way. Strangely enough, the distance has created more intimacy in my experience. And that's meant that I can enjoy it a bit more because it feels more personal. Tell us about working on The Gray Man with the Russo brothers, Chris Evans and Ryan Gosling. It's been incredible. Like, it's just so much fun. When you're working with folks who are not just at the top of their game, but reinventing the game, it's like a whole new machine. You get on set and like, the bros will just be like, hey, you know what would be cool? And then someone else goes, yeah, we know how to do that. And then it just happens. You know, and so it's been, it's been great. It's been a learning experience for me. I'm just kind of stepping on set and taking notes and seeing how legends do their thing um, and trying to be worthy of my space in that. Uh, it's just been cool. Chris and Ryan have kind of dealt with this, the thirst of the internet. Have they been able to impart any wisdom? Uh, I think my lips are sealed. I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, you can't, give the, you can't give away your tips and tricks and secrets. No, absolutely not. Otherwise, you don't know how to skip around the tips and tricks and secrets. You gotta know the secret handshake. Are you a Dungeons and Dragons player? Who is your character if you do play? And what is the secret to a great campaign? I couldn't tell you the secret to a great campaign because I haven't played much pure Dungeons and Dragons. I've listened to a couple of Dungeons and Dragons podcasts in my time. My friends play Dungeons and Dragons. And so I'm kind of doing my research. Paul's like, right, you need to listen into our game. I played a ton of Diablo as a teenager. So like, I'm used to the fact that like, I play a paladin. That's just what I do. And I know what that means <laughs> to a degree. So I'm kind of like a second, second generation Dungeons and Dragons. The best thing about this job is learning new worlds and there is nowhere better or bigger to learn new worlds from than D&D.